Well, last time I looked at this, because I've been away from it for a weekend, um, the meter I decided was about a stop out from where it should be. And so I've got to move my connection one full stop, really. So I'm working out how I'm going to do that. Now the difference, where it reads at the moment, I want my dial around further than that, so let's just see. It reads correctly there. But I need my meter dial, my ASA, my film, my aperture dial should be around to there. So what's the difference in that in terms of position of this setting wheel at the bottom? And am I even turning it the right way? One of those logic puzzles, isn't it? Which piece do you turn when it's upside down, back to front and inside out so it goes the right way? I have to think this one out and decide what it is I'm doing. I know I need to move my aperture scale one full stop relative to the meter. And all I've got to do is do it in the right direction. Well, unfortunately, the selenium cell's failing. If I set it so that it reads correctly at a good bright light intensity, like a bright sunny day, then um, it reads too high in lower light intensities. In other words, it's, it doesn't really read too high at lower light intensities. It means the, the setting has been moved to such an extent that the high light settings appear to be correct, when really it's not, the cell doesn't have enough output. So, there is our problem. The selenium cell is failing. It um, looks well enough. It certainly swings and responds to the light, but it does not respond to the light correctly over a good wide range of um, light, light conditions, which means it's useless for general photography. Since if you know your camera is meter reads accurately in bright sunlight, you don't need a meter because you already know what settings you should be using. Unfortunately, that's the case with this one. So it's a nice camera, but it's going to have to be used with a handheld meter for or the Sunny 16 rule, or with a, um, a light meter app on a phone works quite well too, in order for this to function correctly. And there you have it. So now I know that my meter is never going to be accurate. I can um, relax a bit in that regard because somewhere across its range I know it's very accurate. Everywhere else it's going to be somewhere else. It's like a like a stopped clock. I can move on to the next part of this puzzle I suppose which is cleaning and refitting the finder assembly. Well here's my prism and I think you can see through the back of that finder it's got problems. There's a big problem with the silvering in there. I don't know where that lies exactly, but it's interesting that pattern. I don't think it's a fingerprint. It's like a, uh, a cloth weave, weave pattern almost. It's like somewhere that the prism was put down in the silvering process. It got contaminated somewhere. Something caused that problem. Either it never got, there was some contamination prior to it being silvered, or there was some contamination after it was silvered which has caused that. But you can see there the prism has certainly failed, so it's going to need a new prism. That's not the end of the world. You can still get replacement prisms. Uh, there still seems to be a few left for sale in Germany. And that's what this camera is going to get. So I've got to strip this finder down completely. The screen down here at the bottom, I don't know whether you can see it in here, it's covered in tiny speckles. Now they'll be mildew and they're in between that plastic screen you can see there and the ground glass screen behind it. So the whole 
prism and uh, finder assembly has got to be stripped right down anyway in order to, de to deal with those problems. And I might as well get to it. Possibly the first thing to note is I don't want to set the finder down on that base there, on that clear window. That's plastic, and that plastic is very soft. It marks very easily. So I would much rather hold this suspended in the air, and when I go to reassemble it, I'll be doing it in a camera body, not necessarily the body of this camera, I've got an empty shell which is quite good for building things up in. So I'm removing these screws, the ones from the bracket and the ones from the mask here at the rear of the finder. And the prism and bracket come off completely. I'll put this to one side. Looking at this prism, yeah, it's an interesting pattern. It's on one of these faces. I don't think it's a fingerprint. Anyway, let's get the bracket off. Oh. Separating that bracket from the prism usually, or very often, is instant silver failure on the prism. In this case that hasn't really happened, but the, the silvering's gone anyway. This prism is toast. I can see a pattern here. And one up there. I'm looking on the surface, on the painted surface at the top here, to see if there's anything matching that, which would suggest you know someone poking their fingers on it. There certainly is some pattern at this point, which corresponds with one of those marks. So it's possible that something is etched its way in right through that black protective coating. Or, alternatively, whatever was it causing that problem has telegraphed through the black coating and that's why we see it on the outside. Who would know? But either way, it's going to need a new prism. But I do have to strip this down and clean it to get rid of those mildew specks. First I've got to get rid of this tape. The tape's here covering the various little windows. And it's basically there to keep the dust out. It doesn't really serve much other useful purpose. Alright, so we've got those out. Now here, there's some sprung-loaded frames. Hold this together. They keep the uh, top condenser in place. And there'll be two or three of them. I'm not sure how many I'm seeing here because this it's got the residue of the tape on it. Three by the looks of it. Three. So it's three sprung loaded wire frames holding that in. Let's tip this lot out. So we have a biconvex condenser. Now that's symmetrical, goes either way up. There's a frame that separates the two condensers. Now the one with the steeper step goes down to the bottom, goes to the bottom condenser. The bottom condenser is plano convex. Convex on one face, plane on the other. As a spacer goes underneath that, that one, and then underneath that We've got our ground glass screen. Now the ground glass side is down, so here we're seeing the shiny side of it. Our plastic piece here with our uh, split image for the rangefinder in it is held in, it's got six small screws 
to be used to adjust the position of it to centre up the prism with the hole in the ground glass screen. So I'm just backing those screws up now, one full turn each. Now these are typically locked in with a touch of lacquer. Generally you don't need to apply any acetone to them, you can turn them regardless of that. They're not going to work loose by themselves, but you can turn them with a screwdriver. This one here is a bit more buried in lacquer. I can't really see the screw head. Here it is. Alright, so I've just loosened those all off one full turn each. I'll give that a tap. There's our ground glass. Now I can see the mildew spots on that surface. I don't know if I can get this to show that. There's mildew spots on that surface. And of course our plastic component. I can see an awful lot of mildew spots on that. And facing towards you, that's the surface with the prism on it. That's the surface that goes to the ground glass. So this, I've got to clean in an ultrasonic cleaner. And I clean that suspended in a clip so that it doesn't touch anything. It's only held by the edges. Um, the underside in particular, that's the piece that you could get at with a cotton bud through the open shutter if you were wanting to start playing around. And... You can tell when people have done that because as soon as they start swiping at it with a cotton bud or a q-tip they scratch that surface. It's incredibly easy to scratch the plastic surface. The ground glass screen by comparison is, um, is tough. It's glass. Glass is tough stuff. Plastic unfortunately is not. So I'll get this into a clip so I can put it somewhere safely and then I can start cleaning this stuff up. Here you can see I've got this in a somewhat modified paper clip. The spring has just been dealt to so it doesn't have as much tension as it once did. And I've just got this thing suspended in it so it means that I can put it in the ultrasonic cleaner. The plastic surface sits on nothing, won't come in contact with anything except the uh, hot soapy water. And all that mildew spots will just get blasted away to, to infinity and beyond. Well, first step with putting this finder back together is to clean the viewfinder assembly case, if you like. And here I'm just using acetone to remove all traces of the old adhesive from the adhesive tape that was covering all the ports. This is probably only more for the sake of neatness than anything else. There's probably no practical reason why you'd need to do this. But it makes me feel better having everything nice and clean and ready to go back together. I think I'll have to call this video one step forward, two steps back because there's been a little bit of toing and froing with this camera as I've taken it apart and re rebuilt it and taken it apart again to deal with some minor issue and rebuilt it. And it occurs to me that the exposure meter which I condemned yesterday and said that uh, the selenium cell has simply come to the end of its useful life. Well of course that's quite true, 
but then I recall that I'd been given a parts camera along with this one. So I thought, well, I'd better go and see what the parts camera is like in terms of this exposure meter on that one. Of course, I can't test it entirely because the coupling cord is missing, so I can't check it over its range to see whether it responds to light accurately over a better range of light levels. But what I can see is that there's a greater deflection. Comparing the two meters, I could see that it had a greater deflection, which means that the selenium cell has a greater output, which is very promising. And it means that it's much more likely to be a good meter. So if I'm to place the good meter into the camera that I've now have three quarters completed, it means that I've got two choices. I can try and change the meter without opening up the camera and it is possible and move the cord to the at the top to the new meter without losing the cord over the pulleys without losing the tension or without losing any correct alignment of the cord all of that is possible it's just very awkward or I can just simply backtrack remove the front of the camera fit the new meter in the normal fashion probably replace the meter cord at the same time and then go back re rebuild the camera which means getting the front back on getting all of that timed correctly and then setting the lens uh, mount to film plane distance correctly again getting the front rings in place correctly again and then any final adjustments of the meter again and I'll be back where I was well where I am at the moment except potentially with a better exposure meter. Of course, should it turn out that my chosen replacement exposure meter is no better than the one that's in there, all that effort will be wasted. But I think it's got to be at least worth the attempt. And I've just about got this case clean to my satisfaction. That's looking useful. When I rebuild the meter, I'll mount this in the spare body that I've got here so that uh, I've got somewhere to work. I can get the plastic window in there without having to put it down on something and risk damaging the plastic window. So this is just a camera body that I've got lying around spare. This one, yes it is a used one. Somewhere I've got a Reflex 3 body casting, new and unused, that I was given years ago. Um, and I've had vague thoughts of assembling a camera around it, but really that's a, 
point this exercise. I do not have new unused parts sufficient to do things like that. Well, I'll put a screw in the case here at the back to hold that piece in place while I'm working on it. And then I must go and clean these components up. Most of the uh, components I've got sitting here waiting to be cleaned. And of course this piece, our plastic window, which I've got to go away and get into the ultrasonic cleaner. I'll start putting this back together. Of my plastic screen here now I can tell which way round this goes because there are tiny marks at the ends where those alignment screws bit into it and I know it has to be prism side up well that didn't go stunningly Let's see if I can lift that out and have another go That'll go down. Okay, that's just dropped into place. Now these little tabs on here, they stop that from falling as smoothly as I'd hope. Now I've got to make sure there's absolutely no dust on that surface before I put the uh, next piece on. And I can see something fairly close to the centre here is a mark of some sort. It looks like a dried droplet from when I cleaned this and I was drying it off. It looks like a, a droplet of water has evaporated there and left a little mark. I'm going to have one go at cleaning that with some glass cleaner on a cotton bud and if that's not successful I'll have to take that out and go and clean it again. It's one of the dangers when you're cleaning glass and you're drying it. When it's drying there's always a danger if there's any droplet of moisture on there that when, as that moisture dries it'll leave a mark behind, like a coffee ring. Now that got it. Now I'm angling this so I can see by the reflected window light beside me off that plastic surface whether I've got that entirely clean. Now I've got the ground glass screen here and it goes ground glass side down, plain side up and it goes in on top of that screen. And those little clips I've mentioned, these little clips here and at the end they hold that under tension so it doesn't move and likewise that stops it from dropping freely into position. I've got this mask goes in next And then the condenser lens, this is the uh, Plano Convex, plain side down. I 
mirror I was using a clean toothpick to uh, make sure that was seated correctly. I'm just holding this up to the light at an angle to try and see if there's any dust on any of those surfaces that would cause me grief. Here I've got the separator or spacer. Now the side with the big step goes down against that plano convex condenser. Then I have the biconvex condenser. And then I have the retaining clips. Now in this case there were three retaining clips. Sometimes there's only two. In one camera I struck recently there was only one because somebody would had it apart, put it back together wrong, hadn't got room to put the retainer clips all back in, and so only put one in place. That one's not sitting down very well. I don't think it's correctly seated at that end. That's better. And the last one. That's better. That's good. They're all seated. Now I'm going to hold this up to the light. All my screens are clean. All the Everything's clean in there. That part looks really good. I've got a, a new prism lined up here. I'm going to get ready to put that in place. Well, it would be nice to report that the new prism is perfect and just like a bought one, but unfortunately it's got a few little flecks and specks, specks on it. Uh, in the silvering, there's nothing I can do about that. It's a vast improvement over what we had, because what we had was severely degraded, and you couldn't really use the finder at all. So I've got to put the bracket in place that will hold the prism down. Before I do that, I've got to put the tape in place that will keep the dust out. And that is always a bit tricky. So I need two pairs of tweezers and I'll manipulate these into place.
I'll just cut another piece. And a strip for along the front. <laughs> 